is Wendy Ponomarenko. I'm the art teacher and librarian at Temple Emanuel. Um, as part of our ongoing library project in which we try to bring library resources to our Temple families while public libraries and our library are closed, to, I've been reading a book a night and tonight's book is Passage to Freedom, the Sugihara story. This is a real life story of an actual person who saved the lives of thousands of people during World War II and uh, this book can be found in the juvenile stacks in our biography section. Hope you enjoy. This is Passage to Freedom, the Sugihara story, written by Ken Mochizuki and illustrated by Dom Lee. There's an afterword by Sugihara's son, Hiroki. There's a saying that the eyes tell everything about a person. At a store, my father saw a young Jewish boy who didn't have enough money to buy what he wanted. So my father gave the boy some of his. That boy looked into my father's eyes and, to thank him, invited my father to his home. This is when my family and I went to a, went to a Hanukkah celebration for the first time. I was five years old. In 1940, my father was a diplomat representing the country of Japan. Our family lived in a small town in the small country called Lithuania. There was my father and mother, my aunt Setsuko, my younger brother Chiaki, and my three-month-old baby brother Haruki. My father worked in his office downstairs. In the mornings, Birds sang in the trees. We played with girls and boys from the neighborhood at a huge park near our home. Houses and churches around us were hundreds of years old. In our room, Chiaki and I played with toy German, toy German soldiers, tanks, and planes. Little did we know that the real soldiers were coming our way. Then one early morning in late July, my life changed forever. My mother and Auntie Setsuko wore Chiaki and woke Chiaki and me up, telling us to get dressed quickly. My father ran upstairs from his office. There are a lot of people outside, my mother said. We don't know what's going to happen. In the living room, my parents told my brother and me not to let anyone see us looking through the window, so I parted the curtains only a tiny bit. Outside, I saw hundreds of people crowded around the gate in front of our house. The grown-ups shouted in Polish, a language I didn't understand. Then I saw the children. They stared at our house through the iron bars of the gate. Some of them were my age. Like the grown-ups, their eyes were red from not having slept for days. They wore heavy winter coats. Some wore more than one coat, even though it was warm outside. These children looked as though they had dressed in a hurry, but if they came from somewhere else, where were their suitcases? What do they want? I asked my mother. They've come to ask for your father's help, she replied. Unless we help, they may be killed or taken away by some bad men. Some of the children held on tightly to the hands of their fathers. Some clung to their mothers. One little girl sat on the ground crying. I felt like crying too. Father, I said, please help them. My father stood quietly next to me, but I knew he saw the children. Then some of the men in the crowd began climbing over the fence. Borislav and Gucci, two young men who worked for my father, tried to keep the crowd calm. My father walked outside. Peering through the curtains, I saw him standing on the steps. Borislav translated what my father said. He asked the crowd to choose five people to come inside and talk. My father met downstairs with the five men. My father could speak Japanese, Chinese, Russian, German, French, and English. At this meeting, everyone spoke Russian. I couldn't help but stare out the window and watch the crowd, while downstairs for two hours my father listened to frightening stories. These people were refugees people who ran away from their homes because if they stayed, they would be killed. They were Jews from Poland escaping from the Nazi soldiers who had taken over their country. The five men had heard my father could give them visas. 
official written permission to travel through another country. The hundreds of Jewish refugees outside hoped to travel east through the Soviet Union and end up in Japan. Once in Japan, they could go to another country. Was it true, the men asked, could my father issue these visas? If he did not, the Nazis would soon catch up with them. My father answered that he could issue a few, but not hundreds. To do that, he would have to ask for permission from his government in Japan. That night, the crowd stayed outside our house. Exhausted from the day's excitement, I slept soundly. But it was one of the worst nights of my father's life. He had to make a decision. If he helped these people, would he put our family in danger? If the Nazis found out, what would they do? But if he did not help these people, they could all die. My mother listened to the bed squeak as my father tossed and turned all night. The next day, my father said he was going to ask his government about the visas. My mother agreed it was the right thing to do. My father sent his message by cable. Goodji took my father's written message down to the telegraph office. I watched the crowd as they waited for the Japanese government's reply. The five representatives came into our house several times that day to ask if an answer had been received. Any time the gate opened, the crowd tried to charge inside. Finally, the answer came from the Japanese government. It was no. My father could not issue that many visas to Japan. For the next two days, he thought about what to do. Hundreds more Jewish refugees joined the crowd. My father sent a second message to his government, and again the answer was no. We still couldn't go outside. My little brother Haruki cried often because we were running out of milk. I grew tired of staying indoors. I asked my father constantly, why are these people here? What do they want? Why do they have to be here? Who are they? My father always took the time to explain everything to me. He said the refugees needed his help, that they needed permission from him to go to another part of the world where they would be safe. I cannot help these people yet, he calmly told me, but when the time comes, I will help them all that I can. My father cabled his superiors yet a third time, and I knew the answer by the look in his eyes. That night, he said to my mother, I have to do something. I may have to disobey my government, but if I don't, I will be disobeying God. The next morning, he brought the family together and asked what he should do. This was the first time he ever asked all of us to help him with anything. My mother and Auntie Setsuko had already made up their minds. They said we had to think about the people outside before we thought about ourselves, and that is what my parents had always told me, that I must think as if I were in someone else's place. If I were one of those children out there, what would I want someone to do for me? I said to my father, if we don't help them, won't they die? With the entire family in agreement, I could tell a huge weight was lifted off my father's shoulders. His voice was firm as he told us, I will start helping these people. Outside, the crowd went quiet as my father spoke with Borislav translating. I will issue visas to each and every one of you to the last, so please wait patiently. The crowd stood frozen for a second. Then the refugees burst into cheers. Grown-ups embraced each other, and some reached for the sky. Fathers and mothers hugged their children. I was especially glad for the children. My father opened the garage door and the crowd tried to rush in. To keep order, Borislav handed out cards with numbers. My father wrote out each visa by hand. After he finished each one, he looked into the eyes of the person receiving the visa and said, Good luck. Refugees ca camped out at our favorite park, waiting to see my father. I was finally able to go outside. Chiaki and I played with the other children in our toy car. They pushed as we rode, and they rode as we pushed. 
We chased each other around the big trees. We did not speak the same, same language, but that didn't stop us. For about a month, there was always a line leading to the garage. Every day, from early in the morning till late at night, my father tried to write 300 visas. He watered down the ink to make it last. Gudji and a young Jewish man helped by stamping my father's name on the visas. My mother offered to help write the visas, but my father insisted that he be the only one so no one else could get into trouble. So my mother watched the crowd and told my father how many were still in line. One day, my father pressed down so hard on his fountain pen, the tip broke off. During that month, I only saw him late at night. His eyes were always red and he could hardly talk. While he slept, my mother massaged his arm, stiff and cramped from writing all day. Soon, my father grew so tired, he wanted to quit writing the visas, but my mother encouraged him to continue. Many people are still waiting, she said. Let's issue some more visas and save as many lives as we can. While the Germans approached from the west, the Soviets came from the east and took over Lithuania. They ordered my father to leave. So did the Japanese government, which reassigned him to Germany. Still, my father wrote the visas until we absolutely had to move out of our home. We stayed at a hotel for two days where my father still wrote visas for the many refugees who followed him there. Then it was time to leave Lithuania. Refugees who had slept at the, who had slept at the train station crowded around my father. Some refugee men surrounded my father to protect him. He now just issued permission papers, blank pieces of paper with his signature. As the train pulled away, refugees ran alongside. My father still handed permission papers out the window. As the train picked up speed, he threw them out to waiting hands. The people in the front of the crowd looked into my father's eyes and cried, we will never forget you. We will see you again. I gazed out the train window, watching Lithuania and the crowd of refugees fade away. I wondered if we would ever see them again. Where are we going? asked my father. I asked my father. We're going to Berlin, he replied. Chucky and I became very excited about going to the big city. I had so many questions for my father, but he fell asleep as soon as he settled into his seat. My mother and Auntie Setsuko looked really tired too. Back then, I did not fully understand what the three of them had done or why it was so important. I do now. Normally I don't read the afterword, but being that this is a true story and the afterword is actually incredibly interesting, I'm going to go ahead and read it. Each time that I think about what my father did at Kaunas, Lithuania in 1940, my appreciation and understanding of the incident continues to grow. In fact, it makes me very emotional to realize that his deeds saved thousands of lives and that I had the opportunity to be a part of it. I'm proud that my father had the courage to do the right thing, yet his superiors in the Japanese government did not agree. The years after my family left Kaunas were difficult ones. We were imprisoned for 18 months in a Soviet internment camp, and when we finally returned to Japan, my father was asked to resign from diplomatic service. After holding several different jobs, my father joined an export company where he worked until his retirement in 1976. My father remained concerned about the fate of the refugees, and at one point he left his address at the Israeli embassy in Japan. Finally, in the 1960s, he started hearing from Sugihara survivors, many of whom had kept their visas and considered the worn pieces of paper to be family treasures. In 1969, my father was invited to Israel, where he was taken to the famous Holocaust memorial, Yad Vashem. In 1985, he was chosen to receive the Righteous Among Nations Award from Yad Vashem. He was the first and only Asian to have ever been given this great honor. In 1992, six years after his death, a monument to my father was dedicated in his birthplace of Yautzu, Japan, on a hill that is now known as the Hill of Humanity. In 1994, 
a group of Sugihara survivors traveled to Japan to rededicate the monument in a ceremony that was attended by several high officials of the Japanese government. The story of what my father and my family experienced in 1940 is an important one for young people today. It's a story that I believe will inspire you to care for all people and to respect life. It's a story that proves that one person can make a difference. Thank you. Hiroki Sugihara. The end.